This is the age of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, a period of great social, political and economic upheaval. When advances in science and technology transformed almost every aspect of daily life, including medicine. It was a period of great optimism. Many believed that there was nothing humanity could not achieve. A more rational and empirical approach to understanding the world had made many of these advances possible. But the gap between rich and poor was growing. The grand homes and wealth of the new industrialists were in stark contrast to the poverty endured by many poorer people who had migrated from rural to urban areas in search of work. In this programme, we will look at life in industrial Britain, surgery, infection control, germ theory, and some early public health acts. The British way of life was changing. In 1750, the population of Great Britain was about 10 million. By 1901, it had quadrupled to 41.6 million. People were on the move. By 1851, more people lived in towns and cities than villages. Industrial towns grew rapidly, and many poor people ended up in squalid living conditions. Entire families lived in a single room, with siblings sharing a single bed. Infant and child mortality rates were incredibly high. Neighbourhoods shared communal water pumps, and there were often only a few toilets for hundreds of families. Working conditions for men, women, and children as young as five were downright dangerous. Accidents were disturbingly frequent, but health and medical practices were gradually improving. Medical education and training progressed. The scientific method of investigation, experimentation, observation and recording results became increasingly acknowledged by scholars in the field. Scientists began conducting clinical trials, realising that to verify a particular theory, treatment or cure, large numbers of medical trials had to be conducted. The number of surgical procedures increased dramatically, leading to an overall improvement in surgeon skills. Until the early 19th century, doctors completed an apprenticeship. After 1811, they had to undertake courses in anatomy and surgery, and after 1813, at least one year's hospital experience was also compulsory. In 1858, Gray's Anatomy was published. Seeing the need for an anatomically accurate textbook for medical students, English surgeon Henry Gray and illustrator Henry Van Dyke Carter dissected unclaimed bodies from hospital and workhouse mortuaries. This was legal under the Anatomy Act of 1832. As surgery became more common, the development of anaesthetics followed. Before anaesthetics, patients were usually conscious during operations, feeling every excruciatingly painful moment. Alcohol, mandrake and opium had been used to dull pain, but often the dangerously large doses made patients ill. Death from shock was very common. In 1847, Scottish obstetrician James Simpson conducted experiments on himself and others and discovered that chloroform was an effective anaesthetic. He later administered it to women during childbirth. There was resistance to the use of pain relief. Some objected on religious grounds, believing pain was part of the natural, God-given order. Others were suspicious of doctors and the unknown dangers of these new drugs. Some doctors believe patients should experience pain to understand the difficult and complex work being performed. After Queen Victoria used chloroform during childbirth in 1853, people accepted it was safe. It wasn't. Chloroform can affect the heart and cause sudden death. Ether was also used as an anaesthetic. However, as it's an irritant and an explosive gas, it wasn't suited to operating theatres lit by candles or gas lamps. Cocaine, 
produced from the South America coca plant, was trialled as a local anaesthetic with some success, but it carried the risk of addiction. By the turn of the 20th century, surgery was no longer unbearably painful, but it wasn't necessarily safer. Surgeons often got dosages wrong, with patients waking up mid-surgery or not at all. Surgical procedures were dangerous enough, but often the real killer was infection post-surgery. The most common type was sepsis, also known as hospital gangrene, because doctors still didn't understand how disease was transmitted. Many doctors and surgeons didn't believe they were spreading infection. They enjoyed the good old surgical stink and were proud of their blood-stained gowns, never washed and worn like a badge of experience. In 1795, during an outbreak of childbed fever, naval surgeon Alexander Gordon observed that women treated by a midwife on the outskirts of villages were far less likely to catch the fever than those treated by doctors or midwives going from patient to patient in the village, wearing the same clothing and without washing their hands. To limit the spread of disease and reduce the mortality rate, he recommended that doctors regularly wash their hands and clothes. Joseph Lister, the father of antiseptic surgery, greatly improved post-surgery survival rates. The death rate fell from 46% to 15% when he used carbolic acid as an antiseptic to sterilize the operating room, his surgical instruments, the wound, dressings, and bandages. In 1871, Lister invented a machine that sprayed the patient and the operating theatre to conduct surgery in an aseptic environment. In 1881, Charles Chamberlain discovered that surgical instruments could be sterilised in boiling hot water. And what about the hospitals, where all this surgery was taking place? Many hospitals built during this period were funded by public contributions. Some were even built by factory owners for their workers. Florence Nightingale, a pioneer of modern nursing and the running of hospitals, reduced infection and cut mortality rates from 40% to 2% by keeping wards clean. She wrote two key books, Notes on Nursing, outlining her views on training nurses and how to care for the ill, and notes on hospitals, on how to run a good hospital. The key points were cleanliness and good ventilation. Nightingale also established and self-funded the first nurse training school at St Thomas's Hospital. In the industrial era, smallpox was a highly contagious and deadly disease endemic to Britain up to 60% of those who contracted it died. In 1694, even Queen Mary II of England died of smallpox. And in 1848, Lord Macaulay wrote of the disease. The smallpox was always present, filling the churchyards with corpses, tormenting with constant fears all whom it had not yet stricken, leaving on those whose lives it spared the hideous traces of its power turning the babe into a changeling at which the mother shuddered. Today, smallpox does not exist. So how did we manage to get rid of it? In the early 1700s, most people believed smallpox was caused by bad air or miasma. Other ideas about how disease was transmitted came from further afield. Inoculation used in the Far East for centuries, was introduced to England in 1721 by Lady Mary Montagu. Smallpox inoculation involved a mild strain of the disease being introduced into the body via a scratch. Infection from the mild strain resulted, but so too did immunity to stronger, more dangerous strains. Lady Mary Montagu had her children inoculated during an outbreak and they were immune. English country doctor Edward Jenner was a key figure in the development of vaccines. 
the joy I felt as the prospect before me of being the instrument destined to take away from the world one of its greatest calamities, smallpox, was so excessive that I found myself in a kind of reverie. Edward Jenner Local milkmaids told Jenner they were immune to smallpox after catching cowpox from the cows. He decided to test the theory by conducting an experiment on eight-year-old James Phipps. He injected the boy with pus from a milkmaid's sores. He contracted a mild case of cowpox and was ill for several days. Once he'd recovered, Jenna administered a dose of smallpox. The theory was right. James remained healthy. He was immune. But Jenna didn't know exactly why it had worked. Some doubted these new approaches concerned about doctors doing strange and unprecedented things like infecting people with disease. This cartoon portrays the fear well. After an outbreak between 1837 and 1840, which killed 42,000, the 1840 Vaccination Act was passed, providing free vaccination. Then in 1853, vaccination was made compulsory. England never had another outbreak of smallpox. The big breakthrough came with the development of germ theory. Frenchman Louis Pasteur, chemist and microbiologist, made the key connection between disease and microorganisms. Doctors knew of bacteria, but they believed diseases produced bacteria through spontaneous generation. Pasteur discovered the process works the other way. Microorganisms, or what he called germs, actually cause disease. This meant that once a disease-causing microorganism was identified, a vaccine could be developed to target that disease. Following on from Jenner's work, Pasteur grew vaccines in the laboratory, making it possible to vaccinate large numbers of people, and quickly. German microbiologist Robert Koch then built upon Pasteur's work. In 1878, Koch proved that most disease spreads by contact with an infected surface, rather than by corrupted air as proposed by miasma theory. Koch developed an experimental approach to determining which bacteria cause which disease. He was then able to identify the bacteria that cause septicemia, tuberculosis, and cholera, another disease that had repeatedly ravaged England over the centuries. At first, the British government was reluctant to take action on public health. They didn't believe it was the role of government to interfere in people's lives. Many people felt the same way. But in 1848, after yet another cholera epidemic, the government passed the 1848 Public Health Act. While it was far from perfect, it was a start. The act said local councils could improve living conditions and public health infrastructure if they wanted to and at their own expense. Unsurprisingly, most councils took no action. In 1858, there was one major public health issue that was impossible to ignore. The Great Stink of London was caused by a build-up of human waste and industrial effluent on the banks of the River Thames. It was a result of a hopelessly inadequate sewer system and an extended period without rain to wash the waste away. The miasma theory still held sway, so most people thought the stink would cause illness and disease. Something needed to be done urgently. We can colonize the remotest ends of the earth. We can conquer India. We can pay the interest of the most enormous debt ever contracted. We can spread our name and our fame and our fructifying wealth to every part of the world, but we cannot clean the River Thames. 1858, the Illustrated London News. Action came later that same year. Joseph Bazalgette was asked to begin work on new sewers, markedly improving living conditions and general public health. Londoners still use Bazalgette sewers today. But it was the laws established by the 1875 Public Health Act that forced local councils to provide citizens with clean water, regular rubbish collection and street lighting, things we take for granted today. There were many significant advances in medicine during this period in Britain's history. 
While many lived in squalor, surgery and infection control improved. Scientists learned how diseases spread, and key public health acts helped eradicate certain diseases and legislated for more hygienic living conditions. <laughs>